Uh, hi, my name is Bill Cordua, and I'm a geology professor associated with the University of Wisconsin at River Falls. It's my purpose in these series of short shows to give you an idea of the wonderful geology that surrounds us all every day right here in Pearson, St. Croix County. Today we're going to talk about our drinking water, and I'm standing in front of one of the wellheads uh, from the city of River Falls uh, to sort of symbolize that. Uh, we have wonderful drinking water here in, uh, in town. Uh, we uh, get a notice each year uh, of all the tests that the water has passed. The, our municipal utility manages that and they keep track of the drinking water quality. So about once a year in your utility bill you will get a report from them attesting to the quality of water uh, that we have here. Uh, we're very fortunate to have this resource here. Uh, I get all the drinking water I want every day at a cost of maybe about 40 cents a day from all my various needs around the house. Uh, there are millions of people in the world, though, who have to wait for hours or walk for miles or do without sources of safe drinking water. So we really are blessed to have this resource right here in town. But the water doesn't actually come from exactly from that little building there. That little building houses one of the city's four uh, operating wells. A fifth one is on the way that go down to depths of 400 to 500 feet below the surface. There they tap into an aquifer called the Prairie du Chien Jordan Formations. Um, an aquifer is a layer of rock whose pores are full of water, and so when you drill a well into it, the water simply views that well as another hole and will flow into it. Sometimes under enough pressure to come all the way to the surface, but other times uh, you're going to need to pump it because there's not quite that much water pressure around uh, to do that. Uh, our purpose today is to talk about the Jordan Formation uh, part of that aquifer. Now it'd be nice if we could see the Jordan formation in town here, but we can't. It's 400 to 500 feet below our, our feet. If we could look at it, it's a sandstone very much like the St. Peter formation, which forms the sandstone in our, our road cuts out on the bypass. Uh, but uh, in order to see the Jordan formation, we'd need to have a river capable of cutting four or 500 feet below the surface, and we don't have a river like that in, in River Falls here. So we're going to have to travel a little bit to see the Jordan Formation, and for that we need to go find a bigger river. The Mississippi River will serve our purposes just fine. We're along the railroad tracks going along the Mississippi River between Maiden Rock and Bay City. Uh, we can see in those colorful outcrops on the right some good exposures of the Jordan Formation. The rock used as fill along these railroad tracks is clearly not from around here. These are mostly granites and related rocks, probably quarried near Wausau or Marshfield. You can find some nice gray granites and also some of Wisconsin state rock, red granite. But these rocks on the railroad track is not really why we came down here. We want to look at the Jordan Formation and the cuts. Anytime you drink some water around River Falls, you should probably think about this rock right here because this is where our drinking water comes from. Uh, the Jordan Formation is a sandstone. It's somewhat similar to the St. Peter sandstone we see in outcrops uh, all around the River Falls area. Uh, although you can't see them on this uh, exposure, this has lots of little tiny pores that are usually full of uh, groundwater when this rock is below the water table. Uh, the Jordan Formation was named for exposures in Minnesota. It's uh, well exposed in the Twin Cities area. It's exposed uh, down at the river level around uh, Stillwater where many of you have driven by it and also up and down the Mississippi Valley, usually rather low on the bluffs. As you can see, it's a nice white sandstone. It has some other areas here that are orangish or yellowish in color. Uh, these are iron oxide cements that are helping to hold it together. But it's still very easy to crumble the rock. Uh, I can take a piece right off of the outcrop here and just pretty much crumble it in my hands. It's not very well cemented together. And although you cannot see the openings, believe me, there are plenty, plenty of little tiny pores in here for the movement of groundwater. The soft nature of the sandstone makes it rather easy for people to carve into it, carving names and other kinds of graffiti, including this wonderful face. It was amazing the artists that saw this in the rock exposure down here and had the, the wit to uh, expose it like this. The Jordan Formation was deposited in a shallow sea to beach environment and you can see some evidence for that here in the rocks. These little layers you see in here are called cross beds, and they record the movement of shallow water currents as they move sand across the seafloor. They're very common here, and you can see them not only here, but widespread throughout the Jordan wherever you look at it. 
Here's what the Jordan sandstone looks like when it's magnified. Notice all the clear, rounded grains of quartz, pure silica. The grain size, shape, and durability of the quartz makes this perfect for frac sand. Frac sand is injected, along with a number of other chemicals, to create open spaces and otherwise very tight rocks, and that allows oil and gas to seep out. This is being done extensively in places like North Dakota. The process is called hydrofracking, and that's why this is called frac sand. Fast frac sand needs to be durable, grains all the same size and rounded so they pack together well under pressure, leaving spaces for oil and gas to move through. In order to understand how fluids like water or natural gas or petroleum move through a formation like the St. Peter, we can consider this beaker that I've filled with these little styrofoam balls. These little styrofoam balls are the equivalents of sand grains. And notice as I pack them in here, I can pack them in here pretty tight, but there's always some spaces between these. These are called pores. And this pore space is where the water exists and where the natural gas and, and petroleum will also be able to flow. There's no big cavities or, or, or tunnelways or anything like that in the formation, but there's plenty of space between these little spheres in their porosity to, uh, for, to accommodate fluids. For example, I have some uh, colored water here, and if I pour the colored water into the beaker, uh, I think you'll see that the uh, pores fill up from the bottom, and uh, there's plenty of room there for quite a lot of fluid in here. And the fluid can move this way or that way by seeping between one or another of these little pores. So when you think about fluids within the earth, within rocks, they're generally not flowing through great big openings. They're generally seeping from one pore to another in rocks that have a lot of this porosity and permeability, uh, sort of the equivalent of what you see here in the beaker. The mining of the Jordan sand in this region is not a new thing. Silica sand mining began in Bay City back in 1918 and was worked off and on until the present day. Originally, this sand was used for making glass and other industrial products, but by the 1990s, it was widely used for frac sand. The recent expansion of this industry in the U.S. and elsewhere has created an enormous demand for such sand. Deposits along the Mississippi River Valley are very desirable, especially when they're near railroads or waterways where transportation to the oil field is easy. Here's one of the old openings to the frac sand mine. Openings like this lead to a maze of many miles of underground tunnels and rooms. Today, many of the openings are sealed and inaccessible except for special openings that are left for bats. It's estimated that tens of thousands of bats hibernate in these old mines every year. And these little critters are our friends. Bats don't suck your blood, they don't get caught in your ear, and they don't let eggs in your pocket. They do eat scads of insects like moths and mosquitoes, including pests like the corn borer moth. Ooh, I think we need some of those bats around here right now. A good question to ask is whether or not the frac sand mining of the Jordan Formation will disrupt uh, groundwater supplies locally. Certainly the mining operation does use a lot of water to process the sand and to keep the dust down during mining. However, the Wisconsin DNR does permit this and monitor it, and good quality frac sand mines take great, great care in recycling as much water as possible. Still, there may be some effects on local wells from drawdown because just like any industry, frac sand mining does use water. Uh, in case you're wondering about whether frac sand mining will take place underneath River Falls, remember that the Jordan Formation is four or five hundred feet below the surface and it's neither environmentally nor economically feasible to do any sand mining under those sorts of conditions. So I think our groundwater supply in River Falls is going to be safe for quite a long period of time. Well, Between the Jordan Formation and the St. Peter Sandstone, which you see in River Falls, there's a whole group of rocks known as the Prairie du Chien group, as represented by this boulder right here. These are more limey rocks. They're harder, they're more resistant. Uh, they form the tops of the bluffs uh, all along the Mississippi Valley, and in fact, all along uh, some of the St. Croix Valley, and form all the scenic cliffs you can see around Maiden Rock and Hager City and those areas. Uh, a little hard to look at them uh, when they're on a sheer cliff, but there are some much better places to look at the Prairie du Chien group right in River Falls and that is in Glen Park. So in Glen Park will be uh, the subject of, uh, of the next of my little tapes. Thank you.